Welcome to the Little Miss Movies podcast, where two movie-obsessed parents make their 10-year-old watch movies she'd never watch otherwise. This is episode number 20, A Streetcar Named Desire. Hi there, welcome back to the Little Miss Movies podcast. My name is Christina, and I am a librarian, and I am a writer. I have a book on Jane Russell coming out in mid-June, and I am the mother of one little Miss Movies. And I am her husband. I'm Josh. I'm a TV writer. Um, I've worked on a bunch of stuff that is not as exciting as a book about Jane Russell. It's fine. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's true. Um, and uh, I am the father of Little Miss Movies. Hi, I'm Gable. I'm Little Miss Movies. I'm 10 and what? One foot, what is it now? 10 twelfths. <laughs> five <laughs> sixths. <laughs> Very close. 10 and like 10 twelfths, yeah. yeah. That's probably this number. Five sixths. Okay. Is this simple letter? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're learning fractions. We're learning fractions. That was fun. Um, but I'm in fifth grade and I really like Legend of Zelda and Animal Crossing and Harry Potter and a lot of other stuff. I'm just gonna save myself <laughs> saying Yeah, your, saying that. I like reading and like writing and reading. And Girl Scouts. And Girl Scouts. Yes. And a whole lot more, including Jaws. And of course Jaws. Yeah. But you're a lot in- more. I'm totally gonna yeah, there's a lot. If you've listened to even one episode of this podcast, you'll you know that know. Gable likes Jaws. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it is, um, we are recording this the night before Mother's Day. So this is kind of my Mother's Day gift is I get, I got to pick the movie this week that I really wanted to watch, even though it might not have been completely appropriate to, to show my, my, my 10 and 5, 6 year old daughter. And then we watch what I wanted to watch yes. afterwards. So we... Finally watched A Streetcar Named Desire. And I finally watched The Simpsons episode. A Streetcar Named Marge. Yeah. Uh, Gable, during the pandemic, has binged uh, all, all Simpsons. 31. Except for the 32nd season, which is the new one. Yes, but she, oh, the 31 complete seasons she binged, but I wouldn't let her watch A Streetcar Named Marge because um, it's my personal favorite episode, and I feel that it would just be completely lost on her if she hadn't actually ever seen a streetcar named desire so um so we went ahead and and we watched a streetcar named desire so which is one of my all-time favorite movies so gable do you want to why don't you tell us uh what you think a streetcar named desire was about oh i thought you were gonna say what i thought of it well first tell (laughs) us what it's about um it's confusing (laughs) It's confusing. What's the, what? What like what in, in the in it's the most simplest a, terms? It's about a lady named what's her name Blanche Blanche Dubois Blanche Dubois, who goes to live with her sister because she got kicked out of her apartment house 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 okay. her plantation okay <laughs> like you do okay and then she finds out that her sister's husband is a jerk. Okay. Yeah, that's mainly the, the, the end. <laughs> the end. Okay. The greatest, end. greatest work of fiction of the 20th century. There. That's Bo- right. Boiled down. That's boiled my down to terms. like three sentences by a 10 year old. That's my simplest terms. Stanley you, Kowalski you is a can, jerk. Mm-hmm. You can explain it more. That's my that's my understanding of it. <laughs> okay. Well, yes. Yeah, so it so it is Blanche Dubois, who is a woman who has, you know, fallen on hard luck. Um, you know, she doesn't have a home anymore. She doesn't have a job. She doesn't have anywhere to go. So she turns to her sister in New Orleans and goes and moves into the home of her sister, Stella and, um, Stella's husband, Stanley Kowalski. And, um, hilarity does not ensue, we could say. And so it's just kind of her, her kind of, you know, decline into madness, um, Largely under the the brutality of her brother in law, who resents um, the intrusion that she has, you know, presented to them, to him and his wife. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, what did you think of it? It was good, and yeah. like I said, it was confusing. Okay. What was confusing? I mean, they took a lot of stuff out. 
Yeah. Kind of confusing. Yeah. So that was we, mainly it. That was mainly so. What so what Gable is referring to is that you know this this streetcar named Desire was based on a play by Tennessee Williams, and in order for it to be adapted to the screen, um, a lot of changes had to be made to appease um, the censors to uh, get it a, a, a seal Past of approval. The production code, yeah. yeah, with the production I code. I think we talked about it on our Busby Bird. We might have talked about the production I think, code. Then. I mean, I know I'm reading. Uh, I have to read a biography for school, and I'm reading about Lucille Ball, and it talks about Busby Berkeley, and a bit about a production code. Did it mentions it? I okay, guess. I don't know. Mentions it. And did you go to the production Berkeley. code? I know that. Yeah. Yeah, I know yeah. you do. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's so they had to appease that, and then there was the Catholic Legion of Decency. It had to get past so in order for it to to be presented on the screen you know a few very key concessions had to be made and like we discussed with gable some of the things that had to be kind of glossed over or omitted um makes things a little bit confusing so once dad and i explained to you like what the changes were and what was that in made the original it way plan, clearer it did make it have it make a lot more sense yeah yeah. I mean, it's certainly um, not uh, a movie that's appropriate, one might say, for children. No. Yeah. <laughs> but in its defense, like, I mean, it is uh, in a defense of showing it to a child, <laughs> like monsters. Do we, do we feel the need to defend ourselves? No, but look, the thing about it, and I, we talked to you about this a bit, Gable, is like it, not not the movie, but the, just the material, right? The, the play itself um, is probably the best play of the 20th century like i i'm hard pressed like, I'm there's things say... i like there's things i like more but like that is of of the american canon of of you know plays that's pretty much the apex it's like tennessee williams wrote a dozen fantastic plays and five that are like breathtaking and this stands above all of them um and almost nobody else came close to doing anything quite as remarkable as this as this play um and it's such a um it's such a picture of of a time because it's not the way he behaves is not peculiar the way stanley behaves yeah oh no i didn't like stanley well yeah but that's that's the thing that's that was the reason why the product, like part of the problem with the conduction with the production code was like, yes, there's things in it that were technically against it, but I think the movie also like raised their people's ire against it because they were showing how men treated women, they were showing how um, homosexuals were treated at the time, they were showing how mental illness was treated at the time. Like it really was this mirror to the world in a way of, and not just at the world, but like of middle America, right. Of non-coastal, like this is what it's like to be a person dealing with actual legitimate problems um, in a way that was very, you know, very unique um, and did it on these very small, like in such a small intimate scale that it actually feels very universal. Um, so even like what's funny is, you know, Stanley beats her, like he's a wife beater that stuff's still in the movie they had no problem with that being in the movie like that's they're when fine she's with pregnant it. yeah like his he, pregnant wife you know whereas like if anything if there's anything you want to like not show children that it's it's that it's okay to beat your wife but like that was never a thing that they processed was like is wrong and that's because it was a thing that people did because it was so common you know but i'm glad to hear you say that you didn't like him <laughs> that's like i think one of well i think one of the things that came out of this film and out of the play is was Marlon Brando. So he, you know, just, I think became like a superstar from, from this film and, and he's beautiful. Like he is beautiful and he is dynamic and it is so hard to take your eyes off of him. But I think because of, of Brando's presence, um, people tended to focus on that and not the fact that the character of Stanley Kowalski is, Kind of a monster, a jerk, yeah. yeah. He is. Which is interesting. Which, well, he didn't actually play heroes much at all. Brando, ever. no. Like, where? What? What? Like, where was he heroic? Back in, like, I like nothing springs to mind as like a great heroic Brando role. 
is on the waterfront? No. Uh, <laughs> no, he's a scumbag in that too. I guess so. Yeah, the actors are good in Street Car. Yeah? Yeah. So you were like kind of mesmerized by the performances? Yeah, I think they did good. You think they did good? I think they did good. Well, like they were all, the, the four main um, actors were all nominated for Oscars. Cool. And three of them won. So Carl, three. Carl Malden, who played Mitch, he won. And Kim Hunter, who played Stella, won. And Vivian Lee, who was Blanche, she won. Brando did not win. Um, he lost to Humphrey Bogart for African Queen that year. Hmm. So, but he did win for On the Waterfront, though. Didn't right. he? Like, after, I think so. Yeah, yeah, after. So. I think you mentioned that after we watched the movie. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Okay, so what else, uh, what other thoughts do you have about the movie, Gable? Um, is this either of your favorite movies? It is. It is one of my favorites. I, it is absolutely, I think, like, right up there. Um like with Gone with the Wind for me and with like Scarface and I think Star Wars. Um, Star Wars. Yeah, this, yeah, this is absolutely, gentlemen prefer blondes. Um, this is yeah, absolutely one of my favorite, favorite movies. Vivian Lee is, you know, other than Anne Dvorak, like Vivian Lee is absolutely my favorite actress. Why don't you do biography and her? Um, there's so many. Oh, okay. That's why, yeah, there have been so many books written about Vivian Lee over the because she she was huge. I mean, she was a huge, huge star. Like this was her second Oscar that she won. Like, you know, and that's you know, and a decade apart. Like, yeah, right? like yeah. two totally different for two completely different eras of her life and two totally different types of performances. And two, yeah, two totally different. Oh god, completely different types of performances. Um, Daddy, was it one of your favorite movies? <laughs> So the the play is one of my favorite plays of all time. Like I love I love the play, um, the movie, mostly because of the the cuts and the stuff that's been removed. Like the movie always sort of has that in the way for me. Like it's always been hard to sort of take it. I'm that guy. I like the book better. I oh, like I know. I do too. I do too. I told you. I, I would love to like you know do a like a graphic novel adaptation like of the play that yeah. puts all that stuff back in and along with a lot of other different stories i would love to do a whole line of yeah. you know like, of graphic novels of of you know source material why that don't was you go and do that butchered by because go and ask them what you do it yeah because the rights the rights are too difficult we looked into it oh we've looked into yeah it. we've already oh, looked into okay. it okay yeah okay but no like it, you... it's it's such a it's such a like again like the story is the story, and then we talked about this a little bit too, like with the performances, it's really like a line drawn through Hollywood that once you hit this movie, acting changes. The way that people act is very different going from the 50s on, you know, with this movie is you get naturalism becomes the like kind of Stella Adler actor's theater style, which is that the Brando thing where it's very natural and like, it's not necessarily that he's speaking with excellent English. It's that he's, you know, it was, you know, what, cause you're talking the way people talk and you're just talking, you're talking all the time. You're just, you know, like, in, you feel like a real person. They feel like real people. You feel mm -hmm. like you're actually a fly on the wall in the middle of this thing, which was, you know, kind of was, was a style that existed and was kind of bustling in Europe, but was not really happening here yet, you know? And then it became, it became very quickly the style here and then would lead from, what we've seen in terms of the classic movies we've watched for the for the podcast into the film noirs which is that bridge because the film noirs almost by nature of how how spare they are like there's so little in them everybody all everybody for the most part has a kind of naturalistic performance right because they didn't have time to sort of like rehearse just right like just basically speaking like they just had to kind of go and just do them and so everything comes from that kind of guttural like dark place and they feel real although ironically i mean all of the actors in this film played these roles on stage for a really long time yeah but that's why but that's why i think it's that that's that type of acting like theater acting mm -hmm. was so different than movie star acting mm -hmm. you know movie acting you know and again i mean that's the thing with having you know there's the jessica tandy stuff right that like 
they couldn't have Jessica Tandy because she wasn't a movie star. Well, that, yeah, and so that was oh that that was the point I was going to make was that all of all of the actors in the movie were in the play on Broadway, um, except for Vivian Lee. So she did it um, on stage in England, uh, but she was you know that's how big a star she was that she was the movie star that enabled the movie to get made. And that enabled these, you know, these other three actors who weren't particularly well known at the time, like enabled them to appear in the film. And but sad, you know, but I think it, it, it the actress, Jessica Tandy, who um, originated Blanche on Broadway, you know, didn't get the role. She didn't get to play it on screen. And it was something that haunted her for, for years and years. And so <clears throat> many years later, like... 50 years, 40, 40 years later, she finally won an Oscar for a movie called Driving Miss Daisy. And at the time, Carl Malden, who was who played Mitch, he was the president of the Motion Picture Academy. And when she won her Oscar, she walked up to him and she said, finally, we all have one now. So for 40 years, I mean, I think that that haunted her, that this this character that she had originated and, you know, had been very well received. She wasn't a big enough star to be able to to do it on screen. And so Vivian did. And workshop, right? Like the play yeah. was still being workshopped with them as Tennessee Williams was writing it. So like it was literally a part made for her, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is really sad, but God, I love Vivian so much, mm -hmm. and I just think she's—I think she's so heartbreakingly marvelous um, in this film, and, and that's I think just one of the reasons why I can watch it over and over and over again is because of her. I, I just think she's incredible. What else do you have? Uh, um, okay, I don't know if I should save this question for last. I don't know. Well, go for it, baby. Um, it's the million dollar question. Movie or play? Or should you, or do you want to wait to answer that until we... Which we prefer? Or... Yeah, like, which do you prefer more? I mean, it's tough because, look, seeing the play with Brando in it would have been... What was that? Sorry. A lot of noise going <laughs> on over there. Some cable moving. I was moving. sitting on my leg. She's wearing... <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. I'm sitting on my leg. You're going to have to tell everybody what was really going on. Um, no, I, no, I mean, leg. I like the, the, the performances are un, like the performances are unparalleled. So, you know, we we have these performances to look up because of film. But I think like content wise, you know, the, the, the play is marvelous. Like the play is absolutely marvelous, and, like, cer like, and certainly like not having to water down the the, the content of it. Like so, like, this is the one that like you would you you can see over and over and over and over and over yeah. again. And like, I can go see the play. The one, like this is the one that you would prefer to see over and over and over again. Yeah, I would, and I could watch this play. Man, I saw like, like years, like years and years and years ago. Um, my friend Nova and I, we went to spend like a weekend up in San Luis Obispo. Because yeah. it's just like this really pretty little town. But we were, I think we were like 19 or 20, which we didn't take into account that like we couldn't go to the bars or anything. So, so at night there wasn't a whole lot to do because we were underage and couldn't drink. And there was like a community theater performance of Streetcar. And I was just like, Nova, we've got to go see this. And it was great. Like it was fantastic because the play is that good. So I could like. I, yeah, I, I, I could you know, watch the movie, but I, if there's a performance of it, if it's being staged somewhere and I can go see it, I will go see this stage play, even though it's not Marlon Brando, you know, and Vivian Lee. I could go see it anywhere because I just love that because it is like like Dad said, it is just, you know, like one of the greatest plays of the of the 20th century. Dad. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Okay. I could just watch it all. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 you know, it, I, it is a drag though. Like it is a drag that the, you know, particularly the the speech when Blanche talks about the death of her husband. Because it's just incoherent. It makes no sense. In the film, it, it makes does. no sense that she talks about how this guy she's married to is sensitive and a poet, and she 
tells him that she can't stand him because of it and he kills himself and it makes absolutely no sense i was like wait what 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 was hap- what what happened yeah but the reality was that he was gay and she catches him in bed with another man yeah and this is at a time where you know it is that is just so unacceptable um and she blames she blames herself for his death you know, and the way they do it, you know, and she doesn't say like I killed him, like the you know, in the play the way she does in the film. So that and just how Stanley, you know, sexually assaulting her at the end is, you know, kind of masked over as well. Um, and that Stella leaves him at the end of the movie is like ridiculous because she's just not. Like she's just not. I have one more question. Sure. Who directed the movie? Oh, you want to get dad started on this? His name is Ilya Kazan. Okay. And he was a fantastic director. <laughs> okay. And a terrible person. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's all my questions. That was all of your questions? Do you want to know why he's a terrible person? No, I'm okay. Cool, cool. cool. <laughs> I'm okay. okay. We don't want the podcast to we go can on get forever. The, we can get to HUAC eventually. We'll get to HUAC eventually. Yeah, no, no, I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, I get, the, like for me, yeah. so here's my my curiosity, Gable, is you're somebody, so as we've shown you movies, the things that turn you off are, are violence and general general meanness. <laughs> um, this movie has both. <laughs> um, but you liked it, right? Yeah. Like what I mean, you... Jaws is about general meanness. It's about a shark. Oh, that's a people. shark. The shark's not mean. The shark's just a shark. I mean, the people try to kill the shark in those general meetings. Well, yeah, because that shark's killing people. I mean, what are you going to do? But, I mean, like, the least they could do is, you know, just kind of be like, all right, cool. There's a shark, whatever. Have kill people? Keep killing no, people, no, you the, freak? No, the least they can do is they could just, like, have Let them, it like, destroy the, the, the tourism. No, the it's economy. Like, it's, they could, like, maybe, like, lead it away or something. Okay, we could talk about street cars. So, oh, sorry. Let's get back to street cars, <laughs> Sorry. Please. In terms, because this is a, I mean, it's a movie about cruel people. Like, it's very much, like, Stanley is, like, one of the quintessential villains of film. Um, but you still had, like, a positive reaction to the movie. Like, what do you think was different about this? Like, why do you think the film, like, why do you think the film, like, why do you think you enjoyed it? Or why do you think it appealed to you? Uh... I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Like, was it because it felt grounded, or was it because it felt like it felt more real? Or was yeah, it... I think it was because it felt more real. Yeah, and yeah. it felt less like this is just the thing or that it... where those people are like they're like they're taught that they need to be the best jerks that they can be, and they need to be villainous and evil and shoot laser beams at people and do whatever. Yeah, and were you okay? I mean, because it's not. It's not a movie that has like a tremendous amount of action, you know, at least like the way we're kind of used to now, because now, you know, we have all of these movies. So many of the movies now are just these big bombastic films with, you know, people flying around and racing and kicking and punching and on a ground, like on a very big scale. And this is this is very small, like it, you know, almost the whole thing, you know, takes place in their house. And you're, you know, so were you okay with that? That it wasn't? Yeah. I mean, I probably would have hated Stan, or yeah, hated Stanley way more if he started blowing them up or something. Yeah. <laughs> he also, <laughs> if them. he also had laser eyes, he would yeah. also, he'd be especially bad. If he also did that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What did you think, like, like the, the character of Stanley Kowalski aside? Who you know is a jerk. What did you think of Marlon Brando? His voice was funny. His voice. <laughs> His voice was funny. <laughs> yeah. Just wait. It gets weirder. What? That's pretty normal for him. Like that. This is sort of like him at like this a like, like a two. <laughs> this is normal Brando. <laughs> yeah, it gets progressively as his career went on. He got progressively weirder and weirder. He's yeah. He became a very eccentric person. He's he's actually he's he is the Godfather in the Godfather. Cool. He at one point was in a movie where he uh when he he got very obese towards the end of his life he was very very heavy and 
he thought the director of the movie, uh, Frank Oz, actually, who's uh, the voice of Yoda and Miss Piggy and Fozzie yeah. and Puppeteer, um, became a, a fairly notable film director. And uh, he felt that Frank Oz was shooting was shooting him too wide, that all the all the camera angles were getting too much of his body in. And so he stopped wearing pants on set. What? Yeah. And then he would, whenever Frank Oz would give him direction, uh, Marlon would bend over and invite him to stick his arm up his butt so he can direct him so that maybe he can make him act like a like a Muppet. He was a charmer. That is very weird. Yes, it is. Yeah, Marlon Brando is very weird. He was. Um, one of the things... Uh, so I've, I haven't watched this movie for a while. I used to watch it like when I was in college. I watched it all the time and it's been quite a while. I don't even know if I've seen it since you were born. I think the last time we saw it was when they showed it downtown LA for Last Remaining Seats, which might have been before she was born. Um, there was there was one scene, you know, and then one of the one of the the themes you know of the film is just about you know how much value um, is placed on a woman's youth and her looks. Um, you know, which unfortunately I think still, still rings true today. And there's just this lovely little scene where, um, Blanche is kind of brushing her hair after she's bathed and she just, Vivian just like kind of seamlessly grabs her tweezers and like plucks a gray hair out of her head. And it's just so subtle. And I don't know that I ever really, like, I remember the gesture, but I never quite caught what she was doing, um, until I started, (laughs) plucking the gray hairs out of my head <laughs> this past year. So there's just like the little things like that with Vivian are so effective. And um, when she would kind of go into um, kind of these, these spells of like kind of you know, like psychosis when she was, when she would really kind of start to lose it, um, one of her eyes would cross. Really? And that was, mm-hmm, and that was something that Vivian very deliberately did and put into the character that whenever, you know, things were just really kind of um, unwinding for Blanche, and you look, she would look up and one of her eyes would kind of cross, but just one of them. That is really crazy. That <laughs> is. Vivian, Vivian was, Vivian was a wonderful actress. She was absolutely wonderful. And like, really threw herself into this part. And, you know, and Vivian was somebody who you know, had her own, um, you know, difficulties emotionally over the years and could be, you know, pretty, pretty fragile at times. And so playing a character like this, I think ultimately wasn't good for her. Like it wasn't good emotionally to, um, you know, cause she played it on stage night after night after night, and then to carry it over into the film. And so it, you know, it wasn't great for her, but man, it's, it's, it's an incredible performance for us to enjoy all these years later. Well, and again, like that's also one of the other one of the other kind of hallmarks of this style of acting and like the school that they all come from is this idea of you live, you bring your own trauma to the performance, right? So you bring your own emotions and you bring your own emotional weight into what you're doing. And so you actually like, you know, what you're kind of taught to do is you cry because you actually feel the feelings. You find a way to make the feelings of the character your feelings. And so you you become like so ingrained and so um, in tune with the character that you actually lose yourself. Although, like with Vivian, though, because Vivian, you know, Vivian didn't study right. method acting. She she didn't, and so I think I think particularly with this character, that was. I don't even know if I think that's something she did do. I don't know that she consciously did it because yeah. like when she was doing Gone with the Wind, you know, Olivia de Havilland commented on how Vivian, she just turned it on and off. Like with her, like the acting, she could, she would absolutely turn it on and off. Like they would be preparing for a scene and de Havilland said she would have to like kind of go off in a corner and like prepare herself. And Vivian could just be, joking right. around like joking around with everyone and then they you know and then they say roll and then she's like screaming and sobbing like over her dead mother's body like she could absolutely yeah. just turn it on like she was just this very precise like british trained actress where she she wasn't trained to do that but i do think with, with this character though when those those lines did get blurred when you're also surrounded like the whole cast the whole rest of the cast is that kind of actor. Elliot Kazan is a theater, is a director from 
that same group. So as a director, he's doing that stuff. Like you were just sort of surrounded, just being surrounded by it is going to kind of force, whether you want to or not, it forces you into that same, that same mindset. Yeah. You know, and like in that style of acting is what, like when I went to theater school, like that is the type of, that is the training that we got was taught to do that stuff. I was not a fan. <laughs> not into that i don't oh, yeah. like I, I don't like the whole living your emotions in front of people thing no i took a like a acting for non-majors class and that was like one of the things like we had to do was like to stand up and talk about our feelings and you had people just like burying their soul and i just stood up and just made up some garbage i will say <laughs> I, I didn't do. want to share because i just that was not my thing like i think it was our like my maybe my midterm or like my thesis that i had to do my first year to do like a performance and it was supposed to be like a self-written you know self-exploration piece and i wrote a thing um about when i found a grocery store because <laughs> there because it was i went to I went to, I went to college in boston and there were bodegas everywhere but there weren't like there weren't grocery, grocery stores, stores. Like grocery store grocery stores and uh, one day we were walking, me and a bunch of my friends were just kind of like wandering around the neighborhood and we went around a corner and right in front of us was a star market, as we call them, star market. And uh, I started, I was so excited to see it that I like ran in <laughs> and was just like, j just like overjoyed and I bought cereal and milk and like it was, oh, and like I was literally crying while I was in there. I was so happy. And so I wrote, that's that what was you my wrote about. And they <laughs> thought... Let me tell you about, let me tell you about the most emotional thing that's occurred to me in the past year. Which is like completely on you brand. I bought a box of cocoa pebbles and lactate milk. Okay. I do want to say earlier today, we had to go into Topanga Canyon for Gable to get her. So, and so the allergies of Gable and Josh have gone into overdrive. Yeah. So there's a lot of noises. There's a lot of sniffling. Yeah. <laughs> so Yeah. And phlegm. When you go to, yeah, so there's. We'll, so we'll, we'll edit it. We'll, we'll try. We'll edit it the best we can, but you're, you're, you're sniffing a lot, my dear. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. As she yeah, does like it again. Yeah. <laughs> try, try to, try to do that. So what else? What else? Do you have anything else for us? Um, the movie did not win Best Picture. An American in Paris did. Your mom is furious about that <laughs> which I, I i'm not a fan of an american in paris um but i don't even think i realized that it it got best picture over streetcar so now i like it even less <laughs> this is true but like the thing about an american in paris is that it was the movie that ira gershwin made like he pushed and pushed to get it made as a tribute to george yeah it was like a juke it, it was a jukebox musical but it has no Gershwin songs. does it not have a plot no it does it's just stupid okay it's just a very stupid because i feel like when we saw it at the pantages a few years back they like put a plot in it it had more of a plot it has more of a plot in the it stage has more version. of a plot yeah. in the stage version okay yeah. um street Carster should have won <laughs> yeah well still <laughs> it absolutely should have won best picture and it didn't bring george gershwin back to life so. it did not it, it did not so so gable were you to be talking to your friends via the interwebs or one day perhaps even in person, whenever that happens again, um, would you be like, hey, guys, I saw this great movie about a sexual assault? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> no, you bury that. Yeah. You want to hide that because that's a spoiler. Well, what, what do you think? I mean, do, do you think that we should have no. not shown you this movie? Or yeah. do you think it's okay you saw it? I mean, let me watch this episode. Well, yeah, that's really what I care about. Okay, um, but, but like, you really like it didn't give you nightmares or anything. It wasn't like no, and it didn't show you anything you didn't know about the world for the most part. For the most part, I guess. I don't yeah. know. Okay, I, yeah, I don't, I don't have nightmares anymore. So we we so I shouldn't have too much mom guilt about showing you this movie. Uh. No, it's okay. Yeah. Would you recommend it to your friends, though? Maybe not. No? No. Just because of the content? Yeah. It's so funny where it's like, <laughs> watching a movie where a shark devours a guy <laughs> on screen, blood spurting out of his mouth, totally fine. Because that's the society we're in. Who also, he also says the great... Uh, that great toast, here's this women with, with bow-legged bow -legged women. women. That's all cool. Yeah. 
But, you know. Cause gone like, too far. No, because, like, a shark does not eat people. Sharks I know. don't eat people. But on the it's screen. It's not a thing that can happen. My, my point being that, like, we did not think twice about showing you this, like, <laughs> this gore, this gory movie. But we're, you know, this. I would like to stand on point that I would still be fine showing her Texas Chainsaw. No. <laughs> Mama, tell him I'm never watching it. I just think, it's, in- I just think it's interesting. Tell I mean, him the thing I'm is, never like, watching we it. We could have like just shown her streetcar and then not explained. Because I think just watching it on the surface, I think, you know, you didn't get a lot of it, right? No. I think it's only when we had to like sit down and explain to you what like what what was, was going, going on because they cut out. Yeah, but aren't you glad that you waited until you watched the movie before you watched that episode of The Simpsons? Yeah, because that episode of The Simpsons would have made zero sense. I mean, huh? it made it much more happier once I finished the whole show. No, technically. I will say here's what I'll say about that episode of The Simpsons: she is playing the wrong character. He casts her. Because of how she is like a beaten down housewife Mm -hmm. that has no, she has no joy and everything about her that makes her special has been taken from her. Mm -hmm. That is Stella. So I'm going to go back to the golden age of the Simpsons writing staff made up of the greatest (laughs) writers uh, of modern comedy and complain. Well, it does. And and once you hear me, you hear me, Conan O'Brien. Yeah. You listen up. And let me tell you, like, once we get to, like, these later seasons, like, the so much of the basis of Marge and Homer's relationship is, you know, those lights going. Yeah. Like, there's, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of sex in The Simpsons later mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. So you're right. Marge, Marge totally is a Stella. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. She's just expected to stand there while he ignores her and everything she wants. Yeah. You know, whereas Blanche, like, it's like it, the fact that she wants things and the fact that she has airs and graces just would you know irritates him yeah you know and like homer's not irritated by by marge he just doesn't yeah. even know she's there yeah you're right just saying just you're saying right. they do do in the later episodes sometimes they do have more episodes that are younger where at least that i like oh. <laughs> <laughs> i like that okay i will There's also fun. stand by the funniest because bart and lisa aren't like trying to murder each other. I will also I stand like by the, the argument that the funniest of the Simpsons musicals is "Stop the Planet of the Apes." I want to get off. Okay, my yeah. God, that thing's amazing. That is thing is amazing. But yeah. Streetcar is. It's, it's pretty. Good. It's pretty it's amazing. Good. It's good. It's good. I still like the Stop the Planet of the Apes. Want to get off? Yeah, so good. Okay, so Gable smiles. Uh, Did you write it down? You write wrote down? down your rating just in case you <laughs> forgot. I'm glad it's better than her mulling it over. Okay, what um, is it? Four. Okay, you can afford everything. I know. Well, and we're showing you good movies. Trust me. So, so do you... I don't think you didn't give a four to the Last Dragon as you should have. Last no, Dragon I rad. didn't. So good. Um, I didn't. So, would do you think you'd want? Do, do, are you interested in seeing more movies with Marlon Brando? Maybe. <laughs> or did he not do it for you? Maybe. Yeah. Would you want to see more movies with Vivian? Yeah. Would you like to see Marlon Brando starring in a movie called The Island of Dr. Moreau? It's incoherent and terrifying, but not be- not on purpose. No. Oh, so no. upsetting. So upsetting. No. I don't think we can watch it anymore because that's because the uh, director turned out to be a giant monster. Yeah. Yeah. Even worse than Marlon Brando. Or, or <laughs> Which is really, it's really an achievement. Who knew? But you would want to see more Vivian movies? Although this is, you know, Gone with the Wind and, and Street Crime and Desire are her two, like, truly, to- like, just her, her two, like, tour de force performances. Best. Well, they're probably the best movie. roles she was given to play. Um, although I like Ship of Fools. It's a movie that she did towards the end of her career. And again, she's, ah, uh, yeah, she just throws herself into it. God, I love that woman. So what's next week? I have no idea. Is your pick? Where are we? You. Still got some time before your book comes out, and then we're going to do some Jane Russell movies. One would assume. Oh yeah, yeah, we should. Um, For anybody listening who is not already going to buy your book, yeah, we will just individually shame them by name. We will. But if you are interested, um, yeah, the, the book is coming out. Mean, Moody, Magnificent, Jane Russell and the Marketing of a, a Hollywood, Hollywood Legend. Legend. Thank you. I know what it's called. Coming out on June 15th from University Press of Kentucky. Um, if you would want to get a signed copy, you can go to um, the Larry Edmonds website. I think it's just Larry Edmonds. 
think it's LarryEdmonds.com or Larry Edmonds Bookshop. Um, and that's we'll put a link in the show notes. Oh, we can do that. Yeah, yeah. There's a link so in, the in show case notes. we say it wrong, we'll put so, that there. So yeah, you can get a signed copy by ordering there. And if you don't want a signed copy and don't want to order from a legendary Hollywood bookstore, um, featured please... featured in the Big Sleep. Featured in the Big Sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just saying. Um, find a local bookstore in your community to order it from. Mm, go, they go, can go also, local. if they want, they can buy in Dora. They, if you have not already read Anne Dvorak, Hollywood's Forgotten Rebel, you can order that from Larry Edmonds as well. I like how this turned, I, I signed, this really I turned signed, into a commercial. Much I signed more a of bunch a of copies there, yeah. It's turned into much more of a commercial than intended. Oh, you we didn't really, mean for me to do that? No, I mean, that's fine. But, you know, I was, oh. I was really just talking about what show we were going to do next week. Well, I was giving you time to think by talking uh, about my book. So what are we doing next week, smart guy? Um, smart guy? I kind of think Phantom, because that would be fun. Phantom of the Paradise? Yeah. <laughs> Or oh, of the opera. This is better than Phantom of the Opera, honey. This is Phantom of the Paradise. <laughs> Making sound it like your, all, they your sound first like first Brian De Palma movie. It sounds like Phantom of the Opera is a sequel to Phantom of the Paradise. <laughs> That's what it sounds well, like. Well, in a sense, it is. There's, there's a lot to talk about. No, there's Phantom of the Opera there. is not a sequel to <laughs> Phantom of the Paradise. It was not made in as a sequel. Sense. Other way in a sense, it is. <laughs> I mean, the musical, the the Broadway musical. Family Opera did not come out until after Family of the Paradise. Yeah, but that's not the one where we would ever well, sure. even <laughs> think about. We would instead watch the Dario Argento's Family no. of the Opera, where the Phantom where the Phantom has a rat king that he uses to attack people. No, what? no. I don't want to watch what, that. Do you, know, do you know what a rat king is? It's when um Does it mean the rat king in the nutcracker or does it mean like a no, guy so a rat who's king, like who like um a rat king is a mythical beast that oh, is when a bunch of rats all get together um and their tails all get inter- interwoven, turning into a giant like super rat. Oh. That is a rat king. It's not it doesn't mean also like like a prison rat. No. It's I an mean, episode of Simpsons or mm. that's I know about that because it's an episode of the Simpsons or Homer's a prison rat. Okay. Do you know what I say to all that? I know that. Streetcar. Was up to anything now? I'm going Phantom of the Paradise, I think. Okay. Okay. I'm down with Phantom of the Paradise. You know oh, the okay. yeah. You know the music. I, you know like, the music. I play it. I yeah. play it and sing it. He plays he plays the soundtrack sing. all the time. You yeah. do? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. I love it. Okay. Okay. And then we could do we could do like a complete works of uh Jessica Harper. And We're not do, watching Suspiria. <laughs> Suspiria. Oh, dude. We can do shock treatment. No. We could do yeah. uh uh, the, with the Woody Allen movie, Stardust Memories no, that she's in. I mean, no, we can do no. none of those. Mm, not cool. We can do Jaws and Harry Potter. That's it. There's no. <laughs> you want to put out like a link between Spielberg, like Spielberg produced both. Cool. Like he so produced what was that? The, those movies. Hmm. Wait, what? Wait, which he produced the the Harry Potter movies. He did. Mm-hmm. You oh, I knew there t- was a reason you liked that Steven Spielberg. I did. I thought. No, I thought. The, I, I thought, thought it was because he directed the pilot of Columbo. Oh that's God, that's like. why I love Steven Spielberg. Mm-hmm. Not for that Jaws and Duel. and Duel. And Duel. Not for Jaws. Yeah, Would you Jaws. like to watch Duel, Gable? It's Jaws. It's Jaws with no. the truck. It you like s- it like it. It really is though. You said it's, Alien no, no, was Jaws with an alien. It's not Jaws with an alien. Well, it, it is. is. No, it's not. But this is this is quite literally Jaws with a truck. There's like an well, evil. It, there's like an evil and truck. It's Steven Spielberg, and it's it sounds super stupid, and it's not. Yep. It's amazing. Oh, maybe I'll just when you thought it was safe, safe to, to drive on the highway, <laughs> to drive like through Palmdale. Yeah. Maybe I'll pick Duel for mm-hmm. one of our future episodes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. You really, need to go blow your nose. Some, you guys are just listening to us snort and randomly say things. <laughs> Mine is almost entirely just in my throat, at least. So mine's not in my head. So the the sniffs are all her. That's and the, all Little Miss movies. And the uh, extra low, extra scratchy, phlegmy voice is me. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I, on the other hand, am practically perfect in mm-hmm. every way. Because you don't have allergies. Not like this. All right. Say goodnight, Gable. Bye. God damn it. She never does it. <laughs> Good night. Gable. Gable. What? Say goodnight, Christina. Good night, Christina. <laughs> See you next time. Bye. The Little Miss Movies podcast is hosted by Josh Fialkov, Gable Fialkov, and me, Christina Rice. We're recorded, mixed, and produced in North Hollywood, California. Series art by Gabo. 
Episode art by Gable Fialkov. Theme song by Gibby and the Vs. All contents copyright 2021 Valoria Shines, Inc. Visit us online for more at littlemissmovies.com. I can't believe you didn't say dot com. <laughs> I always do. Oh, dot sorry. com. Should I do it? Do you want me to do it again? No, you're okay. Dot com. Yeah. Mm, sorry. Yeah,